because the family's EFC was $45,000. So there would be probably about $15,000 eligibility. In the third scenario, with the $98,000 expected family contribution, that student would, would only be relying on federal student loans and private student loans. So, so to, to briefly summarize, if the parents decide that they are going to help their kids out by, by making sure the college is paid for, by giving the money directly to the kids. They're basically eliminating those the grandchildren's ability to get any financial aid at all. Right. Okay. Now, in, in one of the things that you just happened to mention was this difference between the calculation based on dependency versus being independent. Right. At, at what point can, can the child, can the, do, it's been a long day. I used to be able to talk. I was a lawyer at one time. At, at, what, at, what point, at what point do the parents' assets stop being considered, if ever? Uh, there's a lot of scenarios that that happens. Most typically is when the student um, reaches the age of 21 mm -hmm. or becomes a graduate student. If the student has a dependent of their, of their own, um, if both parents are dead, and um, if the student was in um, the care of the state of Massachusetts or whatever state they're from as a foster child um, before the age of 13, they're considered an independent student. I see. Those are all ors, right? So right. If, they were, if they're 21 yeah. right. or if they're... There's about right. 10 different scenarios okay. that, that, are, that are... And, and, and in, order to, in order to get, in order to be considered independent for financial aid purposes, do you have to be 21 before the beginning of the academic year that you're talking about? Right. So it's any time before the beginning of that right. academic year? Right. Okay. So that, so that, so that in, in, in that situation, and once that's happened, the parents have to stop being considered at all? Generally speaking, it, yep. yes. There are some instances, grad schools for medical school, um, there's assumptions made. Now, on the, for the federal form, yes. On the CSF profile form, some of the private schools, uh, medical schools will ask for information regarding grandparents, or parents rather, um, for students who are going to, to medical school. To medical because, school. Because of the cost, and they assume <laughs> that everybody's going to be helping out their sons and daughters get through medical school. Because then they're going to be rich, right? Well, they'll be like lawyers once they get out of there, right? They'll be, they'll be. Now, now, one of the things that we were just talking about was the, the possible use of trust in order to deal with any of this, right? So regarding the, the, the kids, it's suppose that they were under, in, Maybe you can't answer this, but suppose that there were a trust for the benefit of the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But suppose the trust said, for example, no distributions can be made to the grandchildren until they are over 21. It, you have to look at who owns the trust and who's responsible for the trust. Um, and if trusts are part of the, the assets that have to be claimed, so if the parents have a trust, then it's claimed. If the student has a trust, it's claimed. But depending upon how the trust is written and how easily they can access that, you can ask the financial aid to do a professional judgment review, um, providing documentation to say, look, we can't get money out of this, or we only get so much money a year out of this. Um, and with that documentation, they can make the changes. Thank you very much. And once again, everybody gets to ask questions at the end. But I'm the moderator, so I get to ask questions anytime. So that, so that gives you kind of an overview. And once again, I think, you know, how many people knew all that? You know, that, that, this, this information often surprises a lot of folks. But it, and it's really important information because a lot, of, a lot of clients are in this kind of situation. Next slide. Finally, there's Mary, who was also going to be getting her $400,000. Uh, her only issue is uh, that she's on Social Security disability. She's on SSDI. Uh, she, was, she got hurt while she was working, and now she is getting a check. Hold, next slide. 
Uh, and in the meantime, her financial situation has not been that terrific. She hadn't been able to accumulate much before she stopped working. Uh, she has savings of $20,000. She had a serious medical issue, which was the reason why she ended up on SSDI, which means she's got accumulated medical bills of $50,000. And her check every month from SSDI is $1,500. So her income, her SSDI income, uh, is $18,000 per year. So what impact would that, would, would that kind of large check, $400,000, have on Mary? Next slide. Um, from Mary's perspective, perspective, there are two kinds of issues she'd want to be, th want to be thinking about. First of all, um, or the parents may want to be thinking about, first, how do we make sure that what we're giving to Mary doesn't end up all going to her creditors, right? Pre-existing or later creditors. Uh, and secondly, if she has a serious medical condition and at some point may need to qualify for MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, for whatever reason, what's going to be the effect of those funds? There's a very simple rule of thumb in terms of dealing with both of these issues, and that is just understanding the difference between first-party trusts and third-party trusts. A, a, a first-party trust is a so-called self-funded trust. If you take some of your own money and you put it into trust and you name a third party as the trustee, and, 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 but you're still one of the beneficiaries regarding that third-party trust, um, and a creditor shows up, the transfer into that trust can be challenged as a fraudulent conveyance uh, if when you did the transfer, you were, uh, the, the effect of the transfer was to render you insolvent. And even if that didn't happen, if you were anticipating those kinds of creditor problems, if that can be demonstrated, then that transfer into trust can be invalidated. And even if it isn't invalidated, if it's a self-funded trust, courts are going to be very kind of flexible in terms of allowing the creditor to look to get to that money. If, on the other hand, it is a third-party trust, if the trust was not funded by you with your money, but by somebody else, your parents, right, your friend, some third party who, instead of giving you money, put money in trust for your benefit, then typically that money is not going to be touchable, not going to be touchable. Creditors will do, certainly not be able to reach it except to the extent that you have the ability to get the money. So if in Mary's case, her $400,000 simply went to her, her creditors could grab that in a second. <coughs> if, on the other hand, if it went in trust for her benefit and she did not have the right to order the trustee to make any distributions to her, then creditors would have no claims until she had actually received a distribution. Because a, creditor, a creditor's only right is to step into the shoes of the debtor and do what the debtor could do regarding getting to assets. So if Mary couldn't get to the assets, her creditors couldn't get to the assets. Same thing is true with Mass Health. Same thing is true also with SSDI, that if there is a third party funded <coughs> trust naming, a, naming someone else as the trustee, she could not also be the trustee, but naming Peter or Paul, for example, as the trustee for <coughs> Mary's benefit, even if that trustee, Peter or Paul, has the discretion to give her the income from the trust or to give her principal from the trust. In either one of those cases, those assets are not going to be countable and are not going to have to be used um, um, for, ma in, for mass health purposes to pay for nursing homes or anything else before Mary qualifies for mass health or before she qualifies for SSDI. So it's really important if you've got a child that is, you know, that is presently incapacitated or, or just as one of those, you know, the art major, you know, that just isn't doing that well. And a really nice kid, but, you know, they have trouble with bills. You, 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 you are not doing them any favors by leaving them the $400,000, right? Well, you, you know, they're going to have, it's going to be a good time for a while. But to the extent that you want to assure that there's some, some, some money to take care of them for a long period, you really want to think about putting it into trust. Next slide. So, as you know, this is the goal of the exercise is to sleep well at night. I am sorry for some people who thought that they had a very simple estate plan and they dealt with all the issues, if this makes you lose a little sleep. Um, but the goal is, if, if, if these are not issues that affect you, well, then you don't have to deal with them, right? You just want to, the goal of the exercise, though, is you just want to have the information. And specifically, as far as Jennifer Liddell's issues, as far as Sharon McLaughlin's issues, so often... 
what you want to do is, it, it, you, there may not be a guaranteed result that you can get, but certainly you want to do the math. You want to talk to somebody who's going to give you some sense of the effect of these d direct distributions to your kids or to your grandkids and to see what kind of alternatives there are. Thank you very much. Any questions for any, any of us?